uh, my red dot is on that the recording is taking place. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic for today, the legume family, taxonomy important family members. With this webinar, it reminds me that in previous webinars that are available, available online, uh, we do have a webinar that's on the sunflower family, uh, a webinar that's on the grass family, and then last year I did a webinar on the spurge family. So that is the, the poaceae or the grasses uh, is the second largest family in Texas. And then the, the one that we're looking at today is the third, lar third largest. But the spurges was the fifth largest. And of course the largest family of plants that we have in Texas is the sunflower family. So those other recordings are available. Uh, if you would like to get on our website and go back and look at those, those are available uh, at all, all times. So notice this picture uh, on this first, on the title slide, and you can see the flowers are very showy. In this case, they're yellow, and the things that are coming out of the flower are the anthers. And at the end of the filament, there is a, a pollen sac there. One thing you will note in this flower uh, that's very similar to bird, um, uh, bird of paradise ornamental, that nine of the stamen are united at the base and one of the stamen is free. So many times we're not looking at these uh, type of structures when we look at the plant but we're looking at the showiness of the plant and the color that is within that plant flower. When I look at taxonomy, taxonomy, the naming of plants, uh, taxon meaning the name of, and onomy meaning the science of the naming, what, what we see is most taxonomy is based on the flower parts as I'm showing you here uh, in this second slide. So in the flower parts, the CA refers to the calyx or the cup that's holding the flower together. The CO is referring to the corolla or what we might call the petals that are the structure inside the first cup. But the corolla can be several intercups itself. So in, in the family, the legumes, uh, the, the family Fabaceae, what we're looking at is a structure in the calyx of five parts. We're looking at the corolla. It's going to have one plus two plus two, basically five parts. When we look at the A, meaning the anther here, we're looking at ten parts. But the structure here, nine are united and one is not. Now, Will this kind of floral formula uh, hold up for everything that we're going to look at? And that's one of the things that we're investigating today. The NG down here refers to an old term, the anther, the gynecium that we have as labeled as the anther part in the flower today. So let's begin our exploration uh, of this group. And let me go to the next slide. The Fabaceae or the legume family includes plants that are classified as herbaceous, meaning they're kind of weeds or they're annuals or they're woody plants uh, like we satch, and they range from the herbs to the vines to the shrubs to some of the largest trees that we have in the rainforest canopy down at the equator. The family is divided into three subfamilies. And that's what we're going to be looking at today with examples in each of the subfamily based on flowers being small, inconspicuous, and arranged in dense heads. That's our first group. Or their, their flowers are small or large, uh, and they are very conspicuous, very showy. They're usually zygomorphic uh, with corollas of five petals that 
the petals are going to be individually distinct. And then the third group is based on seeing three separate petals. Now, what does that mean that happened to the other two petals if the whole family is based on five? We'll see that in our investigation. So, Pete, we're going to have our first poll, as you see on the screen. So our participants, which of the following is a member of the Fabaceae or the Lugum family? And as you look down the list, the honey mesquite, alfalfa, Texas blue bonnet, pinto beans, or all of the above. If you would please vote. Okay, you want me to go ahead and shut it down? Yes, just go ahead and shut it down. And thank you all for voting. Uh, I know Mike, you and Amy had to vote together, so your vote counted twice. Uh, seems we don't do that in the election, but we do that in other kind of things in life. So the answer was E, that all of those four species of plants that I listed, they are all members of the legume family and so when we think about our our daily lives we are working with looking at legumes uh, most of the time and during the day so the legume family in the state of Texas is the third largest family of plants uh, with 74 genera 360 species now the only two families in Texas that are larger the Poaceae the grass family has 131 genera and 545 species of noted grasses in the state. And then the Asteraceae in the state of Texas, we have 171 genera and 620 species, making the sunflowers the largest uh, reported family of plants in the state. When we look at the world and, and everything that's happening, and I'm using information here from the New York Botanical Garden through Arthur Cronquist. The legumes are the third largest family in the world with only the orchids and the grasses being larger. So, and looking at it, look, 657 genera and Dr. Cronquist says there's over 18,000 species. Now, some references will list up to 20,000 but I'm not sure that on a worldwide basis that we've gotten everything together uh, yet where that can be reported as new plants are being discovered and described all the time. The, so the legume family is very important to us in not only in our ecosystem, but for the life of the human being. The, when we think about economic value, one of the number one uses of the legume family plants is things like clover and alfalfa are used as a forage to feed livestock of all kinds. And note that most of the clovers that we know of are not in Texas, but they're from Europe and Asia and Africa. And alfalfa is also a plant that's native across the ocean. So when we look at human food, we eat peanuts, peanut butter, uh, we eat goobers, and then lentils, and beans, and soybeans, and peas, and chickpeas. These are all general common names for groups of plants that provide things that we eat. And so over here on the right, notice the seeds of legumes are the world's most important source of vegetable protein for man and animals. And, and notice that we have soybeans today in a, in a lot of things, and soybean powder is actually used as an extender 
in the hamburger industry, keeping the ground up beef sticking together. The bottom line, ecologically, the legumes are important because of a symbiotic nitrogen fixing rhizobium, a bacteria that lives down in the root system in a nodule uh, that is going to extract inert nitrogen out of the atmosphere and fix it into an organic nitrogen compound and store it in the root. So because of this, we we have plants involved in the nitrogen cycle that we see in our earth ecosystem. Uh, and that's a very important aspect because here in Texas, uh, the data shows that from lightning storms, we get nitrogen through lightning converted to nitrate and nitrite deposited with rain on our land at about 60 to 90 pounds of nitrogen per year. So it's the only element in, in the natural system that actually comes down to the Earth's surface because of something called lightning thunderstorms. The legume family, how do I recognize it in the field? The first thing and most notable characteristic of a legume is the fruit. Uh, and it's typically a one-chambered pod-like or bean-like structure. The second thing we note is that most of the time legumes are going to have a leaf that has three leaflets. Could be two, could be one, could be many. And that the flowers look like a pea flower that uh, when we're raising black crowder peas out in the garden, that many times the flower of a legume looks like that one of the pea. Notice in the, the third item, and uh, it's very important because uh, most of the time that we see plants, they're not in flower, but we're looking at the leaves and the stems. The leaves in this case are pinnately compound, and the flowers are in heads with obvious uh, exerted stamen. Now, that is true with all the many exceptions. So the stamen are in nines, fused, and then one separate type arrangement. But notice my note down here to you on the bottom. Remember what the English teacher taught you. There are always exceptions to the rules, even in plant taxonomy and in plant naming. So some of those things we have to become aware of. Out of Radford et al.'s book, uh, The Vascular Plant Systematics Through Harper and Rowe, this is the diagram for the Fabaceae or the legume family. Uh, notice here in this top left, it's showing the 10 stamen. And as we think about a pea, uh, notice the structure of a pea flower here is going to have uh, five major parts. Uh, one part down here at the very base, this is the calyx, that's going to be five united parts making up the floral cup that holds everything else together. Uh, the fruit here, designated by a picture of this pod or a legume, uh, and notice the floral cup is still at the base. And then when I dissect that flower, um, I can have a banner which has two wings that stick out of it. Uh, and the wing is noted here. But I can also have two parts of the flower that are united that come through the middle of the flower that are called the keel. And the keel, uh, in a Texas blue bonnet, uh, the keel is what we're seeing. But these things are actually split in half when I look at it. So here in the picture to the right, the typical uh, looking pea flower with this type of arrangement. Now, that is only, when I've gone through that description, that is only recognizing one of the three subfamilies that we have in the Fabaceae. So, examples. Notice the one on the left the Baptisia, the false indigo, it has that arrangement with the keel here in the middle and the wings and, and the banner. And then down here at the bottom, I can see the calyx parts. But what about over here uh, on the right in the picture? I see none of that. All I see 
is a set of numerous stamen that are sticking out and actually in the mimosa uh, genus the color of this stamen, the filaments, is what's ac actually making the attractive part of the plant and not the corolla, uh, the part that we saw in the pea plant. So lots of variability in the legume family. So in dividing up the family into three subfamilies, let's look at the Mimosoidae first and let's address what we see in Texas. In general, in the Mimosoidae, the flowers are small, inconspicuous, and arranged in dense heads or clusters. And so in Texas, we have members of the subfamily, the genera, there's 10 of them, they include the albizia, the acacia, the calyandra, desmanthus, lucana, mimosa, um, neptunia, prosopis, uh, pithecelobium, and scrankia. In recent treatments in taxonomy, this genus scrankia, many of the members of that genus have been moved into the genus mimosa. Uh, and we'll see an example of that here in a minute. And then in parentheses, showing you the number of individual plant species that are recognized in each of these genera. So this, this albizia uh, is an Asian plant. And I bet you can't think of what the name of it is, but it's called mimosa. Uh, in, in some groups, the albizia is called uh, pink mimosa. And it has uh, various names including uh, the silk tree as a name of it. But it is an introduced plant that is now in the flora of Texas. So when I look at a, uh, a picture of the flower, this is one single flower, and I'm looking at how things are put together. The, look at the number of stamen being numerous and, and, and the way the mem Memosoidae is described is a minimum of 10 stamen recognized by 10 filaments up to infinity. And so the calyx part is reduced to this red section down here that is still uh, five parted as we see in our formula. So the Memosoidae, an interesting group. What would you believe is the number one encountered member? of that subfamily. And, and looking at this picture on the right, uh, we have the mesquite, honey mesquite, uh, of which in a publication that Dr. Bob Lyons has prepared, we have what we're going to commonly name six mesquite, basically four species and uh, four other varieties here. Note at this time of the year, which is here in August, the number one feature that we're seeing is the legume or the fruit of the plant. So Prosopis glandulosa, in this case, this is variety glandulosa. If I go out in the sand dunes uh, prior to getting to El Paso, I'm going to see a short shrubby mesquite there, and that is the variety Toriana, and the common name on that one in far west Texas is Tory mesquite. Notably, the mesquite, we have all kinds of uses for it, but I've always been interested that the Native Americans made bread from the pods, uh, and also they, they made a flour, and then an intoxicating beer by fermenting the meal. Remember, anything that has carbohydrates in it, like rice and all of our grains, can be fermented to make an alcoholic beverage. So the honey mesquite, probably the most noted legume that we have in the state of Texas. When honey mesquite goes to flower, notice that the flowers are in a head or a cluster, and everything that we're seeing in here are individual flowers, uh, very numerous in the cluster. So this is a, a picture off of our ESSM uh, website uh, for the book, Brush and Weeds of Texas Rangelands. But notice I picked this one to show the flower, but down here at the bottom, if you went to this website, uh, 
for the common plants that we have on rangeland that we do brush and weed control for, there's a whole plant picture, uh, a picture of the bark, a picture of, of the fruit, a picture of the flower, the leaf arrangement, and the stems that when they first come out, they're very green. And only as the stems go into the second year and the third year do they start turning purple, brown, or tan. So in the first year of growth, uh, honey mesquite stems are green. But this is a plant that we've studied extensively because we have labeled this legume as a pest on rangeland. And these two pictures taken by Dr. Bob Lyons, notice the top left picture generally without a disturbance, without a fire, without man using a chainsaw or chopping the plant down, we have a single trunk. But once we come in and disturb this plant through fire and we top the plant while it's young so that it is forced to re-sprout, we get this example in the bottom right. So a lot of the land in Texas today is not growing the single stem plant but notice it's growing a plant where numerous buds at the crown or on the root system down to 18 inches below the surface have germinated, putting up anywhere from one to about 24 stems. And this interfaces with how we end up controlling the plant. What do we do about it if we don't want the plant? But in a general description, the mesquite is a single stem plant, but when we look at what it's doing in our ecosystem on rangeland and we see that fire and man are involved with this plant, uh, we get a different looking plant than the general description. We also know about mesquite that the mesquite bean, not only eaten by humans, but can be a favorite wildlife food for animals like rats and mice to pick up the whole bean or many other varmints or when the pod does open up and the seed come out uh, the seed will be eaten by birds and other animals but notice in this case the bean pod was eaten by a cow and so as it goes through the crunching uh, and regurgitation and the rechewing the beans actually come out and in this pile of manure we have the beans there. Uh, research has shown that about 40% of the beans when ingested by a ruminant will pass through that ruminant or even a horse, a, mono, a sequel digester, and will end up in the feces in the right picture with all these mesquite seedlings that come up. Now, if every one of those seedlings survived or if every one of the seeds in the legume fruit became a tree, Texas would already be covered in one woody plant called mesquite. But many things happen to the seed and other animals chew them and the seed do not go through the digestive tract of other monogastrics. In a second example coming out of southwest Texas and down through the South Texas Plains, uh, we have a, another member of this subfamily, uh, the genus Acacia, Acacia berlandierii. And notice that the flowers are now in a circular pattern, but each individual flower in here, the main thing we're seeing that makes the flowers look white are the number of stamen that are present coming out of the corolla and the calyx. Again, over on the right, the fruit of the wahia is a legume, a thin-walled one, so that when this goes to break apart, there are sections in here where each seed is isolated, and when it breaks apart, then each seed comes out individually. And we'll look at a little bit of how the legume or uh, the parts of the legume break open to release the seed. Another common in the post oak savanna east texas into the edwards plateau in south texas is yellow neptunia yellow neptunia neptunia lutea uh, it's also called yellow puff and if i look at the far right picture notice that instead of having a white 
uh, filaments, I now have a brilliant yellow in this case. If I look at the leaf, the leaf is compound, uh, and the leaf is composed of 2 to 11 pairs of penny. And when I look at each individual penny, each of these side shoots, there can be anywhere from 30 to 60 uh, leaflets in there. So the flowers end up having around 30 to 60 individual uh, flowers in that cluster or head. And so I look at the plant over on the far left. Look at it. It looks like sensitive briar. But the stems on this plant are unarmed. They do not have any prickles. And notice when I go down the mid vein where all the leaflets are attached, that the mid vein has got a white appearance to it. So these kind of characteristics help us as biologists and as practitioners in identifying plants on the land. We don't always have the flower or the fruit. And so many times we're looking at vegetative characteristics uh, to know these individual species by. The center picture, again, is the fruit. And notice how many seed are in there. I can actually count them. In this one, there's nine. Uh, back in this pod, there are ten. And so the fruit is, is variable depending upon how many ovules get set in the flower will determine the number of seed uh, that I'll find inside that pod. So yellow Neptunia, a nitrogen fixer uh, and an important to birds and other wildlife species. The similar plant uh, in this subfamily, look at the right picture and now see that we have pink puffballs. And this species called uh, Romer sensitive briar uh, Mimosa Romeriana uh, is depicted in a lot of books and this one is separate because the kind of fruit that occurred in the genus Scrankia there was barbs all over the fruit and so I see differences once I get into looking at individual uh, members of different genera I find why the different genera exist so in this case, the fruit, a linear legume with prickles, and the legume will split in half uh, and have two valves with seed on each side within the one side of the valve. Notice here in the left picture, I have a genetic aberration or an insect cause of a tissue change. And you see the prickles on this stem here on the left that uh, giving it the briar look, but notice what the flowers look like before they come out. Sensitive briar. What it means is that when I touch the leaves, the leaves are going to close up. Now, sensitive briar and the ones that, this one that we commonly see with the pink flowers is not the only one that will do that. The previous plant, yellow Neptunia, a different genus, Notice the leaves are open here on the left, and notice they have closed up here on the right from having a touching disturbance to the plant. So there's more than one group that, other than the sensitive briar group that can close its leaves. Another common plant that we have, uh, which is going to be our question here, pictured below uh, is the stem with paired thorns and a compound leaf uh, and the number of penny can be seen there and the same plant on the right with orange globus heads. Now, when I look at these characteristics that I've just described, is this plant we satch a member of the subfamily Memosoidae that I've just described? Please check yes or no. And now Pete has the poll up. If you would respond by checking yes or no, is we satch with these orange globus flower arrangement, is it a member of the Mimosoidae?
Pete, I think we can look at the results as that the majority have said yes, and yes is correct. Uh, that the the genus Acacia is one of the genera that's in the subfamily Mimosoidae. But notice the difference and and things that we see when we go out in the field to identify a plant. Uh, a different arrangements of leaves, different arrangements of thorns, different look to the flower. So in taxonomy and in naming the members of this family, it makes it very interesting. Now, we'll move on to our the second of the three subfamilies, and we're going to be visiting the Cecilpinoidae and uh, the second subfamily. Notice the flowers are individually conspicuous, arranged with corollas of five distinct petals, and they're not differentiated. They all look the same. The stamen are externally visible and free from one another. Instead of having the stamen united, here they are, they're free. The leaves can be simple, are once or twice pinnately compound, as we saw back in the first subfamily. The stamens don't have to be 10 in the floral formula, but they can be 5 or 10. So look at the, the common genera that we see in Texas. The Circus, uh, we have one species with three varieties. The Parkinsonia with two noted species. Cecilpenia with nine species. Gladitsia with two. Gynocladus with one, Senna with 16, uh, Pomeria with one, Hoffmanseggia with four, and Chemichrista with six. So our first uh, example in the Cecilpinoidae is going to show that the calyx, the base of the floral cup, is still going to have five parts. And we're going to have a different kind of arrangement in the corolla are the inner, inner floral parts. We're still going to have ten anthers, and we're still going to have one stigma, or one um, on that very famous scientific name I said a while ago, the androsium. The first example, a common one in Texas, not only as an ornamental, but native in East Texas into the hill country, the red bud. Notice the, the legume fruit that I have, and notice in this, for the red bud, I don't have a compound leaf. I have one leaf, one leaflet, and it's simple, one simple leaf. And the flowers over here are following the floral arrangement, and I can see in here I have five parts to the corolla. Now, we have two varieties of this group, of this species, in East Texas, we generally have a single trunk, and that's the variety Canadensis, but it's also sold throughout the state as an ornamental. In the hill country, we have a mesquite, I mean a, a red bud that has more of a multi-trunk, many stems coming out, and that's the variety Texensis. So they're not separate species, but there is a characteristic that scientists in plant naming said we can recognize this. It holds up across the range of the plant, and we will make that into a variety. Let's go and look. Uh, another example uh, in this subfamily, Ratama, which is found uh, in South Texas and up into the lower part of the hill country, and over here in the post oak savanna. It's also called Palo Verde horsebean, Parkinsonia aculeata. It's a shrub or a small tree. One notable characteristic of the plant is that the branches are green. And as you see in this picture on the left, uh, our stems, our branches are green in color. And only with older age and with the production of the bark like structure, uh, do you see something else other than green? In this case, the leaves are twice pinnate, but as you look at the leaf here, and you look at the leaflets, the leaflets are very small, two to four millimeters, 
but where these penny come back to attach is not together. They're generally attached separately. So the smallest in member uh, with the smallest leaflets is the ratama. Notice the fruit. Again, a legume with a constriction in between each ovule or where the seed is going to be produced. Now, look at the bark here. But if I look inside the bark and the areas where the bark is not covering, the inner stem is still green. Notice in the flower arrangement, I have one, two, three, four, five petals making up that flower. This picture on the right is showing a fairly dense stand of ratama going down a fence line. So, an interesting native plant. Uh, other members of the genus Cassia, uh, now into Camichrysta. Uh, let's look at showy partridge pea. Uh, and notice that I can see the five petals. Uh, I can look down, I can see the anther, I can look and see the stamen inside, in this case they're red, uh, and that the stamen in this group are not exerted past the petals. The very first title slide picture, these stamen were longer and exerted out of that plant. In this line drawing, one characteristic of this group is right here where I've got the green arrow, there is a gland there. And since this is the petiole, or the part of the leaf subtending all these leaflets in this section, the petiole, this glandular, I have a petiole gland. It's called a petiolar gland. And in the line drawing, blown up a little bit, you can see the individual gland sticking up there. So the genus Cassia, is commonly noted to have a petiolar gland and when I look at individual members of that genus I'm going to find that in my written description so it's important here is the whole leaf and it's a pinnate leaf and my individual leaflets right here on the petiole right here where this green mark is is where the petiolar glands will occur Another member of the group, common in South Texas, look at the picture here from Mac Allen on the left, our Texas ebony, or ebano, the Pithecilobium flexicali, is a common ornamental, but it's native to South Texas and on our rangeland resource. Here, these small plants are actually younger uh, Texas ebony with more of a wider stem coming up. Notice in the legume, the fruit, if I split one open, in this subfamily, I can see each individual compartment where one seed is being contained. And look at the, look at the seed that are in there. They're fairly large, but I'm only making one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine seed in that one legume. So there's quite a variability in the number of ovules uh, that end up making a seed, and in some pods I can only find five of these, but a common ornamental. Now, in looking at legumes, if I look in our toxic plant book listed here in the middle, uh, extension publication B6105, we have a number of plants in the legume family that are poisonous, and in this book, it's describing legumes that are poisonous to livestock. But 19 of the 106 plants in the book are a member of the legume family, about 18%. So when I get to the genus Senna that, that's in this subfamily, I'm going to be uh, in the Cecilpenioidae, this genus Senna, two of the important ones are... Uh, shown here, the sickle pod senna on the left, the sickle pod referring to the bend or the curve in the legume, or the coffee senna, senna occidentalis, over here on the left. Notice 
that the senna obtusifolia, obtusifolia, meaning that the leaf is widest at the end and narrow at the base. And when I go over here and look at coffee senna, notice the leaves are widest in the middle. They taper at the base and they taper at the end. And again, this is the whole leaf and this is a difference in the two species but by looking at the shape of the leaf. So we do have members of the legume family that are toxic not only to humans but toxic to our livestock we grow in the state. And looking at this one, Senna Romeriana, the old name Cassia Romeriana, Romer's uh, two-leaf or twin-leaf Senna, look at the arrangement and when I look at the leaf it's only in a pair. The leaf only has two leaflets. Well, this is a problem on rangeland with livestock even today because it's a toxic plant to cattle and to goats and to sheep some and horses. Uh, the toxicity and the problem induced in the animal can not only be in the gut of the animal but can be in the muscles of the animal often in uh, cattle simulating white muscle disease that we see there but lots of lots of members of this group let's move into our third and our our last subfamily the papilionoidae in Texas Notice that the flowers have corollas of three separate petals, a larger petal called the standard that has two wings, and then two petals that are fused to form a keel. The leaves are once compound, and they can either be odd or even pinnate, depending upon if there's a terminal leaflet or not, or like in the blue bonnet group, the leaves can be in a palmate arrangement with uh, five to eight leaflets making up the palmate arrangement. The stamens, again, there's going to be a range of stamen from five to ten. And look at the genera in Texas. This is the largest subfamily that we have. There are 53 genera representing the subfamily. Common ones are like Metacago or Burr Clover group, the lead plant or the amorpha uh, genus, the dahlias, the desmodiums, the lespedeza, the sesbanias, uh, the lupinus. With, in Texas we have six. Uh, in Washington DC there's only one native there and in the mountains of the Rocky Mountains they have 150 uh, members of this genus. In Texas we only have six. Uh, the genus is Stragulus, uh, the milk vetches, uh, the wisterias, and more. Couldn't get them all on that slide. But when I look at the picture uh, and I look at the calyx parts, there are going to be five parts making up the floral cup on the outside, and then different kind of arrangements of the stamen, and the anthers again, nine plus one or ten, and then uh, one pistil uh, that's going to be accepting the pollen of, that comes from the pollen sacs on the stamen. Now here's a closer picture. Uh, look at this with me. Again, on a flower, the thing that's holding the flower up there, if it's present, is called the pedicel. And this top of the flower is called the banner. And then the wings are down in here and then the keel that we see coming up through the middle, that is the two uh, petals that are split. And again, the nine of the filaments of the stamen are fused, and one filament is going to be free. Now, in here is also where the pistil is located. So that gives you a cross-section of what this group is going to look like. The most recognized, and uh, when we go to buy flowers or the seed to plant in our gardens, rock gardens. Certainly the Texas blue bonnet is one of the most common. So notice in the blue bonnet here on the right, the Texas blue bonnet, Lupinus texensis, it has a palmate leaf arrangement. 
but it always only has five leaflets. Other members of the group can have more or less leaflets. If I look on the left picture, I can see this arrangement of all the palmate leaves in this early spring rosette. And so when we get warmer and stem elongation takes place, then I end up getting the flower head. And uh, we can see in this cool season annual uh, that the new flowers uh, are white on the banner and the rest of the flower is blue. But as the plant ages, the white spot on the banner ends up becoming red or purple. An interesting phenomena that was written about about 30 years ago on why, on why that happens. So notice the purple spot in here. And notice the white on the banner that's split. And notice the keel sticking out through the middle of this flower. As the flowers begin to open, they're going to have the white spot. Now, why do they do that? Why is that uh, arrangement of the flower there? So we might think uh, in biology that the pollinators of the blue bonnet, who are they? Bumblebees, robber bees, European honeybees. It turns out that the pollinators are like deer. They only see in UV light, ultraviolet light. Well, if I go to a paintball thing and I look at, if I wear a white shirt, I'm the first one shot with the paintball because I fluoresce blue. If I wear a purple or red shirt in UV light, purple and red is black. So in related, relating to pollination, I'm a bumblebee flying around. I see a lot of white. I know that that could be a source of pollen or nectar, and I fly in to get my reward. But when the ovary and the, and the ovules are fertilized, and the pollen runs out, and the nectar sours, that white spot turns red. And the way the story goes, it indicates that the grocery store is now closed. And so when I only, as a UV light pollinator, I only see black, then I'm not going to be visiting these flowers that have no reward. Because if I'm flapping my wings at 300 to 500 times a minute, I don't have time to visit stores that do not have any food. So in the biology of pollination, look, the flower is talking to the potential pollinator. In this question, uh, Pete, uh, we're ready for our third question of this webinar. And notice we're looking at a picture of the legume or the seed pods of the Texas blue bonnet. But the question is false or true? The Texas blue bonnet was the first state wildflower named in Texas. Is that true or false? Would anybody else like to answer the question, right or wrong, good or bad, it doesn't matter. We're going to hear the correct answer coming up next. So Pete, we have eight of our uh, participants responding. We'll go with that data because the answer to the question is false. If I think about the settlement of Texas and where Stephen F. Austin had his original colony uh, coming up the coast and Bryan and College Station is at the northern end of the colony, the Sandyland blue bonnet, Lupinus subcarnosus, was the first blue bonnet that man encountered here. The Texas blue bonnet grows in the central mineral region area, uh, Gillespie County, Kerr County, uh, to Menard and Mason, and all the way up to the Red River. That was its natural area. So it did not occur over on this side of the state. So in 1901, the Texas legislature named the Sandy Land Blue Bonnet as the first state wildflower. 
for 60 years, the people of Texas told the legislature that the Texas blue bonnet was bluer, it was more full with individual flowers, and it should be the state flower. 1971, the Texas legislature threw up their hands and they literally named all the known members of the genus Lepinus. At the time they did it, there were five. Today they were six. But all the members of the genus are the state wildflowers today. So most of the current literature from the Wildflower Center and others will tell you that we have five or six state wildflowers. And what we do in who is the state wildflower? We say the blue bonnet. That means the Harvard or Chesis blue bonnet, the Kermit blue bonnet, the blue bonnet in East Texas that doesn't occur in the western half of the state. All of those are now the state wildflower. So it, it's interesting. Some people uh, know that and some don't. So when I, when I get into the group, look at the genus uh, Baptisia. And the Baptisia, as I see this plant on the right, the, this genus is recognized by being called wild indigo. The one we're looking at, Baptisia bracteata, variety leucophia, it's called the plains wild indigo. And it's common here in the eastern half of the state. Notice in the central picture, what makes it unique is the flowers droop toward the ground, where other members of the genus the flowers are erect and they stand up straight. Notice again, a very large blue bonnet looking flower. When I look at the leaves, the leaves as I see here on the left are in an arrangement of three leaflets. But as I go up the plant, I can actually get up here and have two leaflets. And occasionally the terminal leaflet will be a single leaflet again. In this subfamily, the leaflets are one to three. So look on the ground. A common introduced legume called burr clover is a member of this subfamily. And when I look at burr clover, uh, Metacago polymorpha, I'm going to see that it has three leaflets. Now, when I look at the flower arrangement, burr clover is going to have one or two or a pair of yellow small legume flowers. If I find this same looking type plant uh, and it has a strobulus flower arrangement with 19 and 20 little tiny yellow flowers, that's going to be Metacago lupulina called black seed Metacago. So think about the variability and uniqueness that we have in the floor of Texas. And even for the burr clover, the legume is twisted and coiled two to five times so that the legume resembles a snail. But the number of yellow flowers in burr clover is one to two in each flower head. So we've said a lot about the word legume, the family is named legume, or it's named the pea family. So in our fruiting characteristics, look at a legume here on the, the left of the line drawings. A legume is described as a fruit type with a single carpal, typically dihiscent along both sutures. So there's a suture here on the top and one on the very back that when it splits along the suture, then the seeds can be expelled or dihissed out of the pod. In the low mint, the second time of fruit we have, kind of like the red bud or the fruit of the um, acacias that we have, the low mint is an indehiscent fruit, meaning it's not going to split here on the edges, but more like uh, what I showed in some of the pictures, it's going to ind have individual segmenting of that seed, and each seed is going to be coming out of its segment at maturity. So here, this in, like in the pea group, we have the low mint, and I can hold the peas, but over here in uh, 
various members of the legume family, I'm going to actually have a fruit that's called the low mint. So ladies and gentlemen, the legume family, what are the other characteristics? Things like the viscias, they can have tendrils at the end of the branches for climbing. I can have stipules that are leaf-like things below the leaf like burr clover has. I am a family full of spines trying to protect that plant. The leaves can, are compound. The leaves are, can be arranged in alternate pattern on the plant. So look at the example of this Vicia. This is Louisiana vetch. It's got tendrils at the end. Again, uh, a, a lower characteristic. But these things are so valuable that if I'm going to be a plant namer, I'm going to be a good master gardener, I'm going to be helping other people as a master naturalist, I'm going to be identifying plants on my own land, remember this adage, if you cannot name the plant, you cannot see it. The plant is just green, yellow, purple, red, orange, or black. And until you can name that plant, you can't go look it up in a book and find out everything that man has discovered or written down. So the lesson in, in having programs on taxonomy related to plant naming is that the name of an organism is the key to all information that we have. So we're not able to understand what the wildlife eat, what humans need, is our land getting worse, is our land getting unhealthy, until I can name the organisms that are growing there, because those organisms help me identify the change that occurs in the land. So for today's webinar, I have selected references that are listed here, of which there are many that are useful in the legume family, but I have used Vascular Plant Systematics by Radford, the, uh, the Legumes of Texas by Billy Turner at the University of Texas, and the book has been redone, The Leguminous Plants of North Carolina uh, from the Carolina Agricultural Experiment Station, and then a very popular book still for sale today by Robert A. Vines, The Trees, Shrubs, and Woody Vines of the Southwest. So ladies and gentlemen, and a very interesting topic of taxonomy. It has been a wonderful opportunity for me to introduce you to the Fabaceae, the Legume RP family. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope you will come back uh, for our, our webinars that will have CEU credits related to uh, what we need to know for licensing to buy chemicals and use on the land are the other general topics uh, that we have concerning the rangeland ecosystem. Thank you, and I hope you have a blessed day. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rector. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, put in a, a link there, if you don't mind clicking on that, uh, answer the survey for us. It'll help us for future uh, webinars. And again, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in. Uh, let me go ahead and mention right quick that our next session is going to be September 7th. 